Uh, we are in the middle of Haryana. That sort of always gives me slight uh, cause for pause. <laughs> no idea who belongs to a cup panchayat <laughs> who, who will come up and sort of like uh, insist on burning you to death. But hey, I wanted to apologize because you're young and this is the world we are leaving you. The cup panchayats are our doing. It's not your doing. Uh, I'm really sorry, we should have done a better job of like making sure there was a lovely, liberal, wonderful country waiting for you. We're not, we've, we've left you this one. Um, and, but really, great hope in you because, I mean, you know, you're our last bet. <laughs> anyway, so uh, take it forward, be uh, sick. Uh, okay, here's the beginning. I grew up... Um, People ask me, the first question that people ask me when I say I've been translating from Marathi to English uh, is, uh, you speak Marathi? Uh, so, to, to which the only answer is no, I effing Google translated the whole book. So, what? what do you think? But I think the reason why they ask me, do you translate Marathi, is because my name suggests that Geronimo Maria Pinto. Uh, when I, I went to Adelaide uh, to a literary festival and I presented my passport at the counter and he said, ah, you are Geronimo Maria Pinto. So I said, yes, indeed I am. He said, ah, you have a woman's name. So I said, uh, yeah, you know, it is actually, and he said, that's all right, that's all right. Not everyone has a father. <laughs> But this is an immigration official. You're brown skin. You have a dark blue passport, Indian passport. This is not like an easy passport to have. So you let them think you're a bastard. You stamp, get your passport stamped and you go on and enter Australia. I'm saying we carry with us, even in so simple a thing as our names, we carry our histories and our biographies. We carry other people's expectations. The expectation from a Geronimo Pinto or a Jerry Pinto in Bombay is that you like jazz, you can dance a mean jive, um, you speak English with a peculiar accent, and you are a feckless person who will marry a very good Goan girl who will then spend the rest of her life working very hard at tuitions and at making pickles and at being a secretary to keep you in banyan and underwear. <laughs> this is like the basic fundamental picture of a Roman Catholic. And the other thing is that you have no connection with India. Yeah, because I mean, you know, my family up to about 20 years ago would talk about how they in their films are copying our music. <laughs> our music was western music. I wanted to say, look, we're all brown skinned. Okay? We're not them. They're not us. But right now we have a different uh, ethic and no one seems surprised in my family that I translate Marathi, that I'm now translating Hindi, um, that I learned Urdu to read and write and Maaz, I'm not translating Urdu, not yet. Uh, but that I am interested as a writer, I'm interested in language. And I'm interested in the way other languages work and I'm interested in the way in which other people express their worlds in other languages. So, Balut, it's the first thing that I translated was a book called Cobalt Blue. It was a walk in the park. Cobalt Blue is a, is a wonderful novel. They're all over 21, no? No. Oh, shit. Oh. Okay. How many of you are over 18? Everyone's over 18. Okay, Aruni, you don't have to put your hand up. I, they're very youthful. I do know. <laughs> right. So, uh, Cobalt Blue is set in a, is, is a wonderful novel. It's set in, in a little town which could be Pune and is part of partly Bombay. So it's an unsure geographic space. It is the story of a young man who comes to live in a middle class family which has just emptied a room where the grandparents lived and cleaned the room of the smell of Amrutanjan balm. <laughs> and this is a lovely moment when you're reading the book and you think, ha, ha, ha. You know, when I grow old, I will not use Amrutanjan balm. I have like this rule for myself because it means old people. And I'll, I'll use anything. I'll, 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 
going to pay someone to invent a bomb that smells of aqua de Gio. Giorgio Armani, and that I will rub on my head. I will not use Amrutanjan Bam. Okay, so this book fascinated me because there's this young man who comes and lives there, and the young man of the family falls in love with him and has an affair with him inside the room. But the young girl of the family is not allowed to visit his room because a young girl can't go and visit a boy's room. So she has her affair with him outside the room. <laughs> So geographic spaces are beautifully divided by the hypocrisy of a family. That he, the boy goes up and spends the night there, what he can be doing? Nothing, they'll be talking cricket. <laughs> Actually, bad ball is happening, but not... <laughs> <laughs> cut that, cut that. <laughs> and the girl goes out into the world with him and both of them are broken because eventually he abandons both of them and vanishes. They are both broken but out of the broken pieces other things happen. And breaking to me, the idea of breaking and remaking is really part of growing up. And that is I think the reason why we come to college at all. College breaks something in us, literally breaks something. When I went to college, Elphinstone College for the first time, uh, I was walking in and there were two young men walking in front of me and one young man turned to the other and said, uh, you know, I'm part way through um, Dunn's, I mean to, through the Iliad. And the other chap said, which Iliad? <laughs> so, in my aspirational, I want to be sophisticated way, I was thinking Iliad Padne ka bhi. I have to read this Iliad book, whatever it is. And then when he said, which Iliad? I thought, oh, ek do hai. <laughs> so the first person said to the second, well, of course I'm not reading John Dunn's Iliad. Who reads? I thought, ah, okay, I don't have to read that. <laughs> Uh, I'll read the other one, whatever this guy is talking. And these two were Ranjit Hoskote and Girish Shahani. So, like, you know, kind of like really big, large, huge, sort of when they were born, their mummies ate a lot of fish or something because they're large cerebellums. And that was my, my community of people were all really much better read than I was. I had come thinking I have read all of Sidney Sheldon. <laughs> Mere samne kon Sydney Sheldon. I can tell you which page number or in the Godfather, Sunny and the and the bridesmaid. Page 26, by the way, I still okay. So and you know part of it was uh, was to be dis to discover that there was, you know, someone called Stefan Zweig. And you know, one of my teachers said, you have to read Bava of Peter. So I thought Bava of Peter is like some place. And then my, uh, another friend said, she's saying beware of pity men. So I wrote, oh, oh beware of pity. But Bava of Peter is how they all spoke. So you literally, you're, being, you're in the process of reinventing yourself. You're reimagining yourself. You're re-seeing who you are. And then you have to put down certain things. You put down certain notions and you acquire certain other notions. And to acquire another notion of yourself is to liberate yourself of another notion. So, by the time I had finished college, I was pretty sure that the notion of myself that other people had of me was not fitting me at all. That I was supposed to be watching Hollywood cinema. All my Roman Catholic friends went for Hollywood cinema. And I was sitting and watching Sholay for the seventh time. Okay? And I was really responding to Helen. Which is why I wrote a book on Helen eventually. Because hey, that's, that's who I was. But when I wrote the book on Helen, people said, Jerry Pinto writing a book on Helen? Meaning so, at every stage I have been the wrong person. <laughs> I wasn't the person who was supposed to be doing this work. Okay, and actually Baluta, to get back to Baluta, I was definitely the wrong person to do it. The right person should have done it in 1978, when it came out. It came out in 1978 on December 25. It was a Christmas present to the Marathi world. Okay? We would give it to be fair to the Marathi world that had sort of, you know, been horrible to Dalits. The Bra Maus, I mean Granthali, the people who published it were all Brahmins. 
But understand this, there is nothing so powerful as a self-hating Brahmin. Okay? Nothing as, as... All! Which is why Baba Sahib Ambedkar kept uh, the whole RPI away from the Marxists. From, because every Marxist in, in Maharashtra was a Brahmin. They, b b Marxism became the new Advaita. It was like what you did if you were like really, really a smart Brahmin, you could not but be a Marxist. It was just as simple as that. And so I'm sure half of them thought, okay, chalo, I'm also a Marxist. Then if it is, that's what we have to do now. Chalo, white, nikalo, lal, peno, ajao. This is what... Now, Baluta comes out and it immediately becomes the talk of the town. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone loves it. There are radio programs, there are scholarly discussions. And Marat, the good, wonderful thing about people who, if you haven't, I don't know, uh, do you read any paper, newspapers other than English? No, no? Okay. Yeah, one or two. <laughs> but, ah, you, do you read newspapers? That's the big. <laughs> And I have no problem with you not reading newspapers. Mera baap ka kya jata hai? I no longer get money from them. And you know, like I mean, as long as you read some form of the news in a news space, not on Facebook, not on social media, okay? I mean, I'm fine with that. But if you were to read the Marathi newspapers, even today, the Marathi newspapers do not follow any models or standards. There was a film that came out called Dombivali Fast, okay? Have you heard of it? Yes. Huh, some have, some have. Basically, the idea of Dombivli Fast is this young man, middle-aged man who gets onto the train every day and comes into town and come goes back. And he tries to... Trains in Bombay are terribly crowded, okay? You have no idea if you've not lived in Bombay how crowded a train can be. Because you breathe in synchronicity. <laughs> I'm not joking. You breathe in and the other person breathes out. So that his body comes... <laughs> Actually, it's that tight, and sometimes your hand is like that, and you want to lift it, and you can't. So you say, Bhai sahab. and the Bhai sahab looks, and you say, Haat hatana. <laughs> the uh, man in front of me says, Hey, what Good, hai kya? All this is going on in the compartment, okay? And good means homosexual, by the way. <laughs> huh. No, and that is a fairly common trope. In fact, I was sitting in the department, SCM postgraduate department where, where I teach, polit, uh, you know, and we are talking about sexual politics and molestation, and we have a young pune, uh, Dinkar, he's not very big made, you know, and he said, Hamare saath bhi hota hai, sexual harassment. So I said, in the department? <laughs> and I looked around at all of us, like, who's here? I'm just saying Dinkar. He said, nahi, train mein. <laughs> and I suddenly realized he's carrying scars of having been mauled in the train. Okay, this is kind of all these things are happening. Now, this Dombivli fast, when it comes out, it's being discussed over three pages of the paper. <laughs> there are essays that are running over one and a half page, talking about Dombivli fast, arguing against it. Huge interviews. Interviews are mammoth. They go over 2,000 to 3,000 words. That's one space. It's not your space. In our space, in English space, we have been told no one has the attention span, and especially not your generation has the attention span to go beyond. I'm not being rude. This is what we are told by marketing people. I don't believe it myself, right? <laughs> it seems your attention span is Gangnam style. You can listen to Gangnam style 500 times someone saying it's Gangnam style. <laughs> Without ever losing, getting bored, I think that's more likely. <laughs> I'm. You're a puzzle anyway, but basically, <laughs> we'll leave that aside. So, if 500 words in English, here we are talking about like 2,000 words in Marathi, easily. And now, Baluta produces this kind of response, and here's the story of my connection with Baluta. So, I'm, I'm uh, my a friend of mine, Naresh Fernandez, who now runs Scroll, and I, we both are asked to edit an anthology of Bombay writing. Okay, so we do Bombay Meri Jaan, writings on Mumbai, carefully putting Bombay and Mumbai in the title, so that no one can object. Yeah. 
Subtheriat. And uh, we are in the process of discussing this, we say we need women, we need Dalits, we need underclass, we need poverty, we need trains, we need all kinds of views and ways of looking at Bombay. And at this point, I've, I've read a great anthology called Poisoned Bread, edited by Arjun Dangle. So the best anthology on Marathi Dalit literature that has come out so far. And in that I remember that there's a lovely essay called Sun Eat Your Fill, where your grandmother is telling her son, Gab Gab Itka. You keep, like stuff your face. Okay, and he says, no one says this anymore. So I said, we'll use that piece. And now as a good anthologist, I should have got hold of Balut. I should have read the whole thing and made my own selection. But I was a bad anthologist and I thought this is a nice piece and I like it so I put it into the piece. And for 20 years that was my relationship, I had put my piece in there. Then one day when I was recently someone suggested the city has changed so dramatically, you need to do a new Bombay Mary Jan, you need to do a new anthology, think of a... And so then I was looking through it saying this piece stays, that piece goes, this piece stays, that piece goes. Came to Baluta and said hey I haven't read this book. So I went to Shanta Gokhale, who's my buddy. I'm very lucky with my buddies, really, really lucky with my friends. They're all startlingly brighter than me, including Arunava Sin. So now, like, he's the translation machine. He lies down, raises his legs, pop, and one more translation comes up. And without labor pains also, it seems. Okay, so if you have, and this is, this is the secret, okay? Try to gather around you people who are smarter than you. It feels really terrible. You go home feeling miserable every day, but at the end of it, you're so much smarter than everybody else. Not your friends, but like Janta. So I go to Shanta Gokhale and I say, hey, I want to read Baluta. And she says, yeah, in Marathi, it's still available. So I said, but in English, I'm lazy. I don't want to read Marathi. If I can read English, I can read an English book in a day. It takes me four days to get through a Marathi book. So I want to read it in English. She says, it's not been translated. She says, not been translated? Are you nuts? She's like, 1970? She said, yeah, it's not been translated. So I went out immediately and I walked down the street, bought a copy, read it. Took me three days, four days, five days, something, lots of days. <laughs> a week, okay, whatever. <laughs> and then I went back to her and I said, you know, can I translate it? And she said, I think it would be lovely. Second lesson I learned, if someone asks you, do you think I can do this? Say yes. If they can't do it, that's their problem. <laughs> but at least you've not stood in the way. So I now try to be an exclamation mark rather than a question mark. Because she could have said you, <laughs> and then I wouldn't have done it. But she said you, yes, exclamation mark. So I try to be an exclamation mark, not people. That's for what it's worth. Uh, so I started translating it. I mean, I. And the original person who was supposed to translate it, who'd done that excerpt, here's the territorial pissing of the, of the world, said, I'm going to do it. Are but 30 years have passed, you haven't done it. But she still wanted to do it. But anyway, we resolved that. I started work on it. And I also had a sense of urgency that this book had waited too long. Books that had come out after that, Upreya, Utsleya, many other Dalit and uh, autobiographies, which were literally catalyzed by Baluta. Literally the ground was broken by Baluta, had been translated already, and Baluta had not. And I thought this was really not fair. So I worked lagatar, literally lagatar. And normally I work on three or four different things all at the same time because I like playing. I like the feeling of, this is my, like, I mean, I think of life as a thali meal. No? You know, you eat a little bit of this and then you eat a little bit of that and that cleans your mouth out and you can go back to this fresh again. And it works that way for me. But this one I just did constantly. Then I read it to three different people. I did three different drafts and I finished working on it. And that was the story of my relationship with Baluta. And this is, the only reason I'm telling you this is because I get really tired when I sit in, in this kind of class and I often sit here where you are and listen to people and they say, I'm interested in. I'm interested in doesn't mean anything. There's a, always a trail. There's something that leads you to something that leads you to something that leads you to something. And this is where the something is. And actually for me, it's always been books. If you want to map your own ontology, 
if you want to know how you are interested in what you are interested in, keep a trail. Keep a track of what you were thinking, which really means write a diary. Which really means write a diary every day. And then you will probably be able to tell where your interests come from. And you'll be able, probably at the end of it be a little more self-aware. A diary is lit theory will tell you that you do not write a diary except as a public enterprise. All diaries therefore are public enterprises. I have the feeling that the person who wrote this theory was the kind of person who read other people's diaries <laughs> and wanted to invent a little way of saying this. But it actually is true. I often write my diary, I often wrote my diary earlier as if for a reader hundred years later who ought to know how intelligent and sympathetic and right-minded Jerry Pinto was. This is already such an act of hubris. The imagining of someone who is interested in you some hundred years later. The pretense that these diaries have survived all that time. And that someone is reading you not just to find out Athe Dal Ka Bhao Kya Thaus work, but subaltern studies actually reduces us to all that, right? We are, the person is not so much important as that person standing for a certain com community, society is, right? So you're, I'm imagining myself as the study of, this is a literary study <laughs> of that remarkable writer called Jerry Pinto who lived in the late 20th and early 21st century in Mumbai. That's who I'm imagining myself as, as the subject of many PhD theses, etc. <laughs> now, now having read PhD theses, I can't think of anything more horrible to happen to a writer. <laughs> Present company excluded, he said, hurriedly looking around the room. Okay, uh, I've spoken for half an hour. This is about as much as I have to say. Now you have to ask questions. If you do not ask a question, you can give me 500 rupees instead. I will accept currency happily. You were told, no, that if you don't ask a question, you have to give 500 rupees. Yeah, so get your money ready or get your question ready. No, you didn't tell them. <laughs> okay, thousand bucks. Then. <laughs> Let's raise the ante. Go ask anything you want. Anything. Really anything. Um, hi, go ahead. Do you have any association with tea? Tea. Oh, okay. See, you know one of the strangest and most bizarre things about the world is when you come out into it and discover how people are so different. So when I grew up, I thought tea was like mother's milk. <laughs> it was basic and fundamental and something that everyone had. So when you went, like uh, I started, when I started going to college, the, my first shock was getting into the train. And I was standing there in the second class compartment with a man in front of me whose breath smelt of garlic. Now, not that I have anything problem with garlic, but I remember just thinking, what has he eaten for breakfast that could have garlic in it? Because in my family, breakfast did not taste like any other meal. <laughs> breakfast was porridge, toast, or if you got very lucky, you got a boiled egg, and tea. That was all that there was for breakfast. That was breakfast. Garlic never came near the menu. <laughs> Garlic was very clearly lunch or dinner. But this man was obvious, and then I would start sniffing people's breaths. Just to see, I, I know it sounds pervy, you know? <laughs> really, now that I think about it, it sounds pervy. But, and then I remember asking a friend, what do you eat for breakfast? And he said, oh yeah, well, like puri bhaji and all. I said, vegetables. <laughs> like spicy vegetables for breakfast. It's so fascinating. And then I remember, so then you begin to realize people live and eat in different ways. So then you ask me, what do you eat? What do you not eat? And then you say, do you drink tea? Oh. You say, oh, oh. What's wrong with tea? It's not alcohol. Oh, alcohol. <laughs> okay, alcohol I get, what's wrong with tea? No, you get black if you drink tea. <laughs> no, actually there's really no relation between melanin and tea. Not melanin and all don't, huh? you get black, everyone knows. <laughs> so, so everyone means what my granny said. And you don't go on anyone's granny. So, but I realized that tea and coffee in upper class Hindu households, were things that you drank in adulthood. 
and you had to make a choice to drink them. And your parents wouldn't object, but they wouldn't be really happy. And some people didn't even drink coffee when their mother was around. <laughs> And when I said, you don't drink coffee when your mother is around, that girl said, Aap kya jane, nazar ki sharam. <laughs> to which all one could say was something like, I mean, completely random, like, just the Jew, just ki thi. <laughs> So, fundamentally, for us in the family, tea was panacea. In fact, one of my friends rang up and said, after the prize was announced, this Wyndham Campbell thing, which made me very rich, etc., etc. <laughs> so, you will know that the money has not hit yet. When it hits, then I will fix the button. Anyway, uh, she rang up and said, what are you doing? I said, you know, after it was announced, when the chap announced it to me, my sister, first thing she said was, don't believe any rubbish like this. This is phishing. Don't give them your bank account number, they'll clear it out. So at, uh, for a moment I thought, uh, don't be ridiculous. Then I thought, huh, I didn't even apply for this prize. She said, see there, all those people you keep telling, you know that lottery, they get a lottery without buying the lottery ticket. It's the same thing. So I said, okay, let's have tea. So we had tea. One hour later, someone called from Yale University, who's a friend of the family, and said, Jerry's won this prize to my sister. So my sister said, you actually won the prize. So I said, okay, let's have tea. So we had tea again. Then we had acidity. But that... See, in severely dysfunctional families, and mine was a severely dysfunctional family, like for instance, Saturday, and if my father did not insist on us having bath, no one insisted. <laughs> Everyone stayed bathless in Bombay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Bombay, we could stay bathless for a week. My mother thought bathing was not human. She said, do you ever see an animal bathing? No animal bathes and they get on perfectly well. It's only other people's requirements and I don't mind if you smell. <laughs> so everything, like I mean, footwear was optional, going to school was optional, <laughs> studying was optional, uh, you know, eating food was optional, <laughs> bhajias and coca-cola was the best possible uh, thing, and if after eating the bhajias and coca-cola, throw the paper on the floor and cover the dirt. <laughs> that was my idea, my mother's idea of housekeeping was throw paper everywhere to cover the dirt. <laughs> And if people want to lift up the paper and look at the dirt, let them. Endless maniacs. Because you didn't want your friends coming and like... <laughs> and Hindus have this strange habit of taking off their shoes. No? When they come into the house. Christians don't... Any, any Christians here? Are you going to get here? Okay, two. Very good. Anyway. Uh, all I'm saying is that this... So then you, okay, if prayers are not particularly, you know, my mother would start praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, if you say so though, and I've never known what heaven actually means, and if, and if heaven is within us, then are you within us, and I'm, are you comfortable, and when I take pills, do you take pills as well? Shrik, Bane, we would say, stop it now. Say, okay, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What does hallowed mean, Baba? <laughs> Prayers also drifted off on God. Nothing. My mother went to church and we had to say, please don't sing the hymns. Because everyone would be singing, I surrender all. My mother would be singing, I surrender something. I surrender few things. Why do you need me to surrender at all? What's this big thing? Stop, you know, so, in the middle of all this, you have to create, families have to create their own, or dysfunctional families especially, have to create their own rituals. And now here's actually the uh, flash. Mine wasn't a dysfunct more dysfunctional family than most families. 
Most families are pretty mad. <laughs> Don't you know this about your mom? Don't you know this about your parents? That they're all barking. <laughs> that they're like weird birds. But when we step out into the world, we tuck away the weird birdery. <laughs> okay? If I'm in the big home, I had anything to say to anybody is because I was saying, Dek yaar, sare weird birds idhar padhe hai. <laughs> And very often because of that, many people would come up to me and say things about their families that they would not have said for years. A woman came to me in, in one, of the work, uh, one of the readings and said, my brother heard voices. And so we locked him in his bedroom for five years. Five years in a bedroom, one boy, 15 to 20, imagine that. I couldn't, I, you, know, you know six degrees of separation, no? that we are six degrees of separation away from Obama or anyone in the world. I didn't think it was more than one degree for a mental problem. We're very close to mental illness, very close to that sort of thing. And that one degree is sometimes not even one degree, it's us. Outside in the world there is a great show of the rational. There's a great show of how everything is decided according to the rational. Freud gives us this lovely image. He says, the subconscious is like a maddened team of horses running away with the coach, taking its own route, going wherever it wants. And the conscious mind sits like the terrified driver holding the reins and not being able to control the horses and his only job is to explain to everybody that the, where the horses were going is where they wanted to go. <laughs> this is what we do largely with our lives. We act irrational and pretend rationality. We tell ourselves the rational story post facto after it. Okay, And this I think Actually, if you think about Baluta as the story of an exclusion, of the story of marginalization, who hasn't been marginalized? And you can think about it yourself. Marginal on the basis of gender, well that's 50% of you. I hate to break it to you, but 90% of the world's money is still in male hands. 75% of the world's land is still in male hands. You're already marginal. Caste, skin color, looks, abilities, body shape. Every moment of our lives, we step into a situation and we are judged. We are judged and we are either drawn into the center of the situation or we are kept on its periphery. When you are kept on its periphery, you begin to stop there and you begin to examine much more carefully the operation of the group. When you are drawn into the center, because of whatever it is, you're the right color, you're the right look, you're the right person, you're the, you the right level of society, you drive the right car, you wear the right clothes, you speak the right language, whatever it is, as soon as you're drawn into the center, you become a person unable, unable to write clearly about that situation. This is why you will always have to make place for the angularity of the writer. The writer is always going to be the person in the corner of the room, looking at the rest of the room in perplexity at her exclusion. <coughs> unable to understand why she can't be part of this great jamela taking place in the center of the room. And from that position of angularity, from that position of exclusion comes truth. A certain unpalatable truth often, which is why so often you hear of writers as Desh Drohi now, writers as anti-national, writers as, as Perumal Murugan is a good example. And here is another very interesting moment of translation politics, okay? Perumal Murugan writes his book about, and you know the story, right? That basically if you're in, in certain communities, if you are, if you've been trying for a, for a child for a very long time, and you don't get a child, you generally bring in, you outsource the man's role. The woman, if she's fertile and the man's not, she goes and sleeps with someone else. 
Very often it is a brother, the husband's brother. Very often it's a close relative so that the caste and the gotra don't get mixed up. But in some communities you even go to the temple and sleep with a stranger. This is the basic fundamental story of, of this book, One Half Woman. It's called? One, part. One Part Woman. This woman does it, gets pregnant, gets a child and the marriage begins to break up because of the husband's jealousy. When it came out in Tamil, nothing happened. Book came, some people read it, some people didn't read it. It's a literary book. It's not got one big sexual description of the young man and her in the temple or anything. It was just like she went into the temple, had sex and came back. And came out in English. That's when the community started getting offended. Because now it is clear that we are, our world is being opened out to a larger world. We are now being perceived in a certain way and we don't like this. The same thing happened with Baluta. The strongest negative response was from the Mahar community. It said, why are you doing this? Why are you digging up dirt? Why are you saying these bad things about us? We are not like this anymore. Oddly enough, today, when I translated it, uh, the Mahar community, Pradnya Dayapavar, who is his daughter, uh, was fine with the translation. She was happy that the book had happened. Very nice person. She's a poet herself. Um, the Mahar community was silent. Right-wing Hindus started the usual flaming on, on social media, saying, why are you... Why have you translated this monstrous book? Monstrous because this does not happen anymore. It may have happened in 1978. And Daya Pavar is talking about the time when he was younger. So 1958. But it doesn't happen in 2008 or 2018. To which the only answer is, every time I have a reading of Baluta, I always do caste atrocity news. And India does not let me down. Someone beaten to death for trying to enter a temple. Someone, some children refusing to eat because the woman cooking in the in the back room is a is a Dalit. We continue to be a caste-ridden community. But I also add this in defence. I always say, you pick up the Examiner, which is the Bombay Parish Christian. Ah, I'm so sorry. I'm sure you've all told, put off your phones and... <laughs> sorry, 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 I'm at the cinema, what nonsense. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sorry, I don't know how to do... Uh, mute, yay. My CA gave me that phone. So I still don't know how to use it much. Okay, sorry. Um, what was that? Yeah. Brings out an uh, examiner and the examiner's one of its chief du uh, duties is it has a matrimonial column. Where wanted Roman Catholic Brahmin bride is always part. The caste is always a requirement. Is there an upper caste in Roman Catholic? Surely you jest. Of course there is. <laughs> oh, let me tell you of my favorite story, okay? There's a little village called Kunkoli in Goa. Yeah, yeah, Ashrafi elite and all. Yeah. Oh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, when he, he, he said, I was born a Hindu, I will not die a Hindu, and he went out, took the Mahars out. First, he went to the Christians. And he said, will you take my, if, you, if I bring you my people, will you treat them exactly as you would treat your high caste converts? And they said, no, sorry. Up to 1950, you could not become a priest if you were a Dalit convert to Christianity. The Pope had agreed. <laughs> hmm? uh, 90, all this ended as soon as the demand and supply situation inverted itself. Now there are nobody, there's no one becoming a priest now. <laughs> yeah. So demand and supply. There were lots of people applying for the priesthood. Uh, sorry. So Kunkoli is a lovely little village in Goa. You go there and it is gorgeous. Like, you know, sun-soaked and a beautiful church from the 17th century. And this lovely procession. Then, one of the goddesses of the village, Mary, is taken to see her sister Shanta. 
Her sister Shanta <laughs> and her sister Durga. So she goes in procession, carried by the Christians of the village and goes and meets Shanta. Then prayers are said there. The Pandit comes out and blesses. Then they go to Durga. Pandit comes out and blesses. Comes back home. So now Jesuit priest enters situation. Jesuit priest is full of liberation theology and discovers to his amazement that the shoulders bearing Mary, Mother Mary, a lady aloft, have always been Brahmin shoulders. You don't let their kind. So he says, no, 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 hey, come on, that's all old-fashioned. And now we'll have some low caste people also bearing Mother Mary aloft. So the people of the village, the ones who are used to shoulders, were used to taking that strain, printed their sh and everyone gets a sash. Okay, and so I would get a sash with my name on it. Okay? Baraya okay. Brahmin. I don't know. So the sashes would have, say, Dugamu Rose Rosario Maria on one side. They printed their sashes that way and they put Sardesai on the back <laughs> and Kamat on the back. And they said, if you allow those, them. We don't believe in caste men. But, <laughs> but if you allow them to carry the thing, then we go back to being Brahmins. We leave Christianity and we'll flip our sashes. The poor priest had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> Old priest came, old priest said, now only Gaumkars can carry men, they are Brahmins. And everything went back to normal. The Ambedkar next went to the Muslims and said, the basic fundamental, okay, and Hinduism, the challenges for, to Hinduism were from Christianity's, I believe, from Christianity's compassion and Islam's brotherhood, bhaichara, everyone's equal. The Prophet said you must eat from the same dish, which is still the thal concept which is in Bohri's for instance. Not done anymore because you know the drivers would be very embarrassed to eat with us. <laughs> it's about them really, it's not about us. Really, I'm only thinking about them. Which is fine, fair enough. I wouldn't want my servants eating with me. I get that, I understand that, but that's the religion. So, Ambedkar goes to the, Brahm, uh, to the Muslims and says, if I bring my people to you, do you promise equality? And the Muslims say, no, we can't. Which is why he chooses Buddhism. The untold story of Ambedkar's move. Why would you choose Buddhism otherwise? Sorry, next question. Yeah. Huh. Sorry, yeah. huh. Jerry, what was it like to be M? To be M? See, one of the things that I did was I practiced. I was Leela. If you've read my book on Leela Naidu, I play a 65-year-old woman. The book is an I book. So, I, the way it worked was this. Um, I knew Dommarais just fleetingly. He, he wasn't my kind of person. He just seemed like a nasty piece of work. I didn't like him. Okay? But he was a great poet. I mean, a fabulous poet and I loved his poetry and then I met him and I didn't like him. But I fell in love with Leela the first time I met her. She was just gorgeous. And she was, and all of you are gorgeous. Everyone's gorgeous. But one of the things that I think gorgeous people need to do is not to know they are gorgeous. So Leela had this trick of deliberately forgetting she was beautiful. And so she offered it to you as a gift. Like, you know, I, know you're, I know you're just stunned by how good I look, but it doesn't matter. It's nothing at all. Get over it. It's class. <laughs> it was so charming, so effortless, so elegant. You know, she would always appear with her hair pulled up in a bun and wearing these dowdy dresses. She like, and, but still she was, you know, and then she'd offer you an offer. When you're leaving, she says, you must take something with you. And I'm thinking, the MF was saying painting? <laughs> <laughs> of course it wasn't that. It was an orchid in an egg cup, but hey, you know, I just went on thinking, an orchid in an egg cup. That's such a lovely, perfect 
perfect gift for me. Then I went home and showed my mother and she said, cheap bitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, the deal was, when, uh, she, uh, and you know the story, uh, the Leela and I do again the story. I was sitting with Adil Jassawala, who's another great friend who was telling me this, he's like, uh, <laughs> Leela Naidu was telling me a story about her grandmother. She was sitting in her garden, when, uh, in her living room, when someone knocked on the door. And she went to open, and the maid went to open the door and then she heard a thump. And it sounded like a body falling over. So she went outside and the maid had fainted. So she looked out of the door and there was a naked Russian standing on the doorstep. <laughs> I do not know, said Adil, how she knew it was a Russian. <laughs> But perhaps. <laughs> and so she invited him in and he came in and he said, I did not kill him. So she said, assuredly, monsieur, you did not kill him, but why don't you have a cup of tea? And she was having mint tea and she gave him a dressing gown to put on, her husband's dressing gown. And then the keepers from the nearby asylum came running over. And this was, count, was one of the counts who had kid, attempted to kill Rasputin. <laughs> And he'd been incarcerated there after his nervous breakdown. And he escaped from time to time. And he would come suitably clad after that to have tea with, his, uh, with uh, Leela Naidu's grandmother. And so Leela Naidu's grandfather once hired Mussolini in his... <laughs> Surely you jest. <laughs> I said, this is fabulous, she should write her book. And he said, you know, she wants someone to write it with her. I said, I will. So she called me up and said, let's write this book together. And I was happy to go there. But, I mean, it was, took about five years, largely because she would drink coffee at nine in the morning. This was a lot of coffee and, you know, a little coffee and a lot of vodka. <laughs> so the book took a lot of time to do. But it was still my exercise wheels. I think now in retrospect. I didn't do it then. I did it because I really enjoyed her stories. So the only woman who was sitting and drinking tea in some, you know, in some Parisian cafe when she was pregnant with twins at the age of 17 and uh, Ingrid Bergman and she had a doctor, the same doctor, and then someone was peering around the corner and doing sketches of her and it was Salvador Dali. <laughs> And halfway through, like towards the end, of, close to the end of the book, I was thinking like, Kitna jhoot bolegi re. Mat jhoot pe jhoot. Because everyone, you know, you'd mentioned, I was, I was watching this thing by Louis Mal and she said, oh Louis. <laughs> so you knew Louis Mal? Oh yes, don't you know, when he came to India, uh, my, grand, my uh, mother brought all her carpets out and we piled them on the, on the th and Saraswati Devi sat on top of it and sang this beautiful, <laughs> and then Louis Mal's diary has Leela Naidu mentioned in it. And suddenly you think, okay, maybe you're not lying then. Maybe. And then bizarre stuff, like you open, I, I said, oh, Leela, we need pictures for this book. She said, oh, darling, it'll take some time. But I said, Let me look. She said, of course you must look. Go right ahead. So then Sail Vamu was the assistant came and said, you want to see the pictures? I said, yes, I want to see the pictures. Went to a room, opened one cupboard, back pictures. Opened a second cupboard, back pictures. 17 cupboards full of photographs. Okay. But then I'm putting my hands and pulling them out. Richard Avedon has signed one. I'm putting out another Henri Cartier-Bresson to my beloved Leela. I pulled out one and it was signed by Imelda Marcos. Who took a picture of Leela? <laughs> the bizarre stuff in that house. She showed me Dom Morais' FBI card. He'd been given certification by the FBI to go into Vietnam. <laughs> I was in Miranda House for like a month. Okay. And so I went to Miranda House and I was looking at the records and luckily I had a cousin who works in Miranda House to show me the records. Guess who were Leela Naidu's local guardians in Delhi? <laughs> My favorite store. President Radha Krishna. <laughs> the 
president. Imagine calling up the president saying, she's come home drunk. What are you doing about it? And her godmother was Marie Curie. <laughs> Whatever. So, one of the good things about M is she's fictitious. One of the best things that has happened to me, and I think it's always very pleasant, is that people take the book as non-fiction. Okay? Uh, to me, that's a compliment. It's a great compliment. But here's the flash. If I say something is non-fiction, everyone has to agree that it's non-fiction. That's how it happened. If I say it's a novel, it becomes a novel. Even if it is how it happened. I say it's a novel. But I also say, 95% of it is fiction. 95% of it is fact. And if you know your Venn diagrams, <laughs> you will know that there is a patch in between and that patch is where you come in and decide whether it's a novel or not. So what was it like being M? Walk in the park. Because my head till today is filled with how, with her language. Much of how I speak, much of how I, I present myself to the world is a pale imitation of her. I, could, I can write another M without even thinking about it, but it would be going back to my own vomit. So I wouldn't. Yeah? Hmm. Anything? Any other question? Uh -huh. Again, you? Uh -huh. As a follow up to a question, hmm. so you wrote nine novels before you turned 20. Hmm. So you always. You know what? So five of them, I have to admit, were Mills and Boone. <laughs> See. <laughs> I was growing up at a time when feminism had barely arrived in India and women expected to be taken out. And you had to pay for taxi, you had to pay for ticket, you had to pay for popcorn, you had to pay for everything. And I had no money. And so my sister who was reading lots of Mills and Boone at the time and her friends started commissioning me to write Mills and Boone. They would tell me the plot outline. They would say, see all these books now, there's this girl whose brother is in trouble and she has to sleep with the guy with the boss of the, of who's, you know, like who's, uh, brother, to get her brother out of trouble. I want you to write a book where she says no. She will not sleep with him because her brother is in trouble and then he will fall in love with her and by page 30 they will kiss and by page 55 this will happen and I would take down very studiously the notes and in longhand I would write a novel and give it to them and I would be paid 500 rupees. So five of the novels were really like that. It was one, then there was one woman who wanted only intercultural romances. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote his Indian wife. <laughs> then I wrote, what? His, no, what? Her Spanish husband. <laughs> and recently one of them uh, said, I still have the book. I said, please burn it. <laughs> She said, no, I'm going to blackmail you. <laughs> I'm going to actually publish this. I'll go to seven. I said, okay, do what you want. I mean, it's like, it's one's history. Like, what do you, what do I care? Like, his Spanish wife comes out, like, with Jerry Pinto's name. Or, oh, so, chal ho gaya. What, bachpan ki, what jawani ki bhool, as they say. Ah, tabhi kaap rahe jawani ki bhool. <laughs> so, it doesn't matter. But, uh, I would have like, I called her up and said, like, I'd like to read it also. You keep a copy, give me a Xerox, and she said, no, no, I'm joking. They all lost. That. But this is also the funny thing, you know. Uh, at one point, I was in the Times of India, right? And all the young artists today used to illustrate for the Times of India. So they would do illustrations, Jitish Kalla, Trina Saini, Lalita Lajmi, Mario Miranda. All these people did illustrations, Badri Narayan. And I would pick them off the floor because they were thrown out and make cards out of them, Christmas cards and Diwali cards and send them to friends. So recently I wrote to all my friends and I said, look, you know, I sent you these, these things which are really valuable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying give them back. <laughs> Itna khadus bhi nahi hume. But I'm saying if you sell them, think about me. <laughs> and can you imagine not one person kept them? Not one person. Amazing, no? 
Anyway, so, um, so what was your question? <laughs> yeah? So, uh, you oh, I wrote the nine novels before I was here. Yeah. So you always mentioned that the, uh, the writing comes with the right to rewrite. So hmm. let me know what rewrite. Okay. See, the f actually, I didn't say that with the drive to rewrite. Yeah, that's in the Hindi interview. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Rewriting is really okay. I have fun. I have lots of fun. I, I there are lots of people say right. It's a very painful thing. And you're like, it, I drag it all. I tell you, I love writing. I just like happiest when I'm writing. Okay. Let's get that fundamentally done. I'm unhappiest to rewrite. <laughs> but it is necessary. It's like toilet training your child. You, know, you can't send it out with shit in its diapers. <laughs> okay? You have to clean it up and do a civil job. And still, last novel sent in, Murder in Mahim. <laughs> this is the story. Murder in Mahim. I write a letter and I finish it in like oh, six months. Yeah, Ravi said, go, go, said Ravi Singh, my publisher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote it and sent it. He said, lovely. I said, ah, very good. I said, after me. <laughs> Except it's not working, said Ravi. It's not working. I wrote, I'm in the big home. What do you mean it's not working? He said, yeah, yeah, I'll try and explain it to you. So for two days, I hated Ravi. Then the third day I read it again and thought, oh fuck, it's really not working. <laughs> so I started working on it again. Then I rewrote it and sent it to him. And he said, hey, fabulous, great stuff and all. Let, give me two days and I'll get back to you. <laughs> it's fabulous and great stuff, why do you need two days to get back to me? You know, the first section of it is so well written. And the second half, do you think you could do some work? Rewrite the whole thing again. Four times. There's a Hind uh, Hindustan Times Crime Writers Festival. I was invited for the first time to launch the book. No, you are. Book was not there. Second time they said, this time will be ready. I said, yeah, yeah, of course it will be ready. No, you are. They say it's not there. Now, finally, about two days ago, I got an email message that said, that's very nice, but I think we just need a little time. <laughs> so he's going to make me do a fifth rewrite. Okay. But some of the rewrites I do myself, some of the rewrites get inflicted on me. Okay? Uh, and, but I believe, see, there are two kinds, three kinds of writers. There are writers who produce it, yeah? and they send it off, and they take pride in that. Sometimes you can hit it off, I don't think you can. I think this is probably the worst kind of writing. The second kind of writer works, reworks, gets a good book out of it. The third kind of writer, kills the book by reworking it constantly, kills it dead. Yeah? The danger lies between these two. Not to fetishize time, not to fetishize rewriting, not to fetishize style, not to fetishize uh, the elegant and the perfect phrase, the rhythm of the sentence. Some, I, and, but how one gets to that stage, I don't know. I really don't know. I still don't know. And I think when I know I'll fall down dead. You know? Yeah. You see? Yes, sir. Could you elaborate on your response to Helen? Helen? Oh, uh, first, I mean, but fundamentally, I remember the moment when she actually impinged on my consciousness, actually, and I went to see Dawn. Okay, the first Dawn. There she is, and she's standing in the doorway, okay? And she's shimmying, like bits of her are shimmying independently of each other. And because this is a Hindi film and Amitabh Bachchan is there and Amitabh Bachchan is like, oh yeah darling, and he's packing his bags and putting his toilet trees and said, Helen, naturally you're pagal. Stop, at least look. And then I remember I hadn't read Freud yet. But there's a moment where she's down right on the floor, right? And the camera's in front. And she takes his gun and empties the bullets. <laughs> Meaning. And then she's flicking the bullets under the bed. And I'm thinking. I remember thinking, yeah, this is a very, this is a symbolic. I didn't even know what symbolic, but I could tell symbolic. What symbolic? Huh? Now, by the logic of these things, I should have wanted to write a book about Helen. 
<laughs> simple thing. I had no idea. I, Pankaj Mishra once asked me to write a book on Bollywood. And I tried, I started writing Bollywood, you know, like, my favorite Bollywood song is Javan Janman Haseen Dil Ruba. And there is a hedgehog or a porcupine of various spikes in the middle of the, of the dance floor. And there is uh, Parveen Babi who cannot dance. Dance. Ay, ay. That was the weirdest film in the world. Wahida Rehman's voice over is used at one point as the villain. But she is the hero's mother. Why does she want to kill him also? It just like so little made sense. And I was telling this to some to Pankaj Mishra and to other people, and he said, Wonderful, you must write a book on Bollywood. So I started writing a book on, on Bollywood, and I thought, no one writes a book on Hollywood. They write about specific characters in Hollywood. This Bollywood is right. No, I'm not right. So I never wrote it. I never did that book. But when one day Ravi was sitting and, and chatting with me, and there was some background was that Mungla. Man, good kid Delhi. I love that song. Okay. Uh, I, we are both listening to this song in the background, okay? And uh, there's a moment in it where she says, uh, And what? See, this is the other thing about her. You can't sing the song without like doing a thumka. <laughs> it's just like your body starts moving, like just naturally, because on her face. Okay, so now what do you have? You have like these people, mm, <laughs> like they're going to bite you or something. The item girl is always like, mm, yeah. you know, you're not going to get me. You know? you're too, I'm too sexy for you, baby. That kind of like look. Helen was this wonderful, smiling invitation to pleasure. Like everybody dance. You know, like we all could get up and dance. So I have, I have been to Punjabi uncles' parties where the Punjabi uncles get up and like, you know, shimmy or what not. Mainly because Indian men are not used to being desired. <laughs> so it's... Our nasib is that we But... Helen allowed you to pretend that you could be desirable. <laughs> and I thought these were the, and see, okay, then also she was Meeran Chin Chin Chu, so she was Chinese. <laughs> then she was, oh, this is a charming ADC, senorita, someone from some Spain. <laughs> then she was like, I mean, in the middle of, a, I remember one film in which she's doing uh, this Dandia. <laughs> Helen, why are you doing Dandia? <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay. Why? What is that about? Then she said, tribal bell. She's Sultana Daku. I mean, it's like, if we didn't have Helen, we'd have had to invent Helen. And for 30 years, she danced. 30 years. Seriously, I mean, you know, that was an achievement. And all this, of course, like, I mean, you know, in the course of, of watching several hundred films of Helen, and you're just like, mainlining Hindi films. <laughs> I'm thinking, ah, oh, here's that ma sequence again. Ma! <laughs> but so, for me, I should have known that I wanted to write a book on Helen, but Ravi Singh said, and this is the role of an editor, to lead you to the book that you want to write. Said, who can write a book about Helen? I said, me, without thinking about it. Next day I started. I mean, next day I went to Lamington Road and bought like, and see, I mean, at that point in time, there was the VCDs had just started coming out, and the DVDs were not even, DVDs were slowly a little later. But no one had the Helen films. I mean, there's one Helen film called Chor Darwaza. Okay? Where guess what she plays? Helen of Troy. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah. And there's a great moment in Raj, uh, Harish Chandra Taramati. So Helen comes and does one big dance. Huh? And Prithvi Raj Kapoor is Harish Chandra. <laughs> And when he has finished, he, when she has finished, he says, Sundar. <laughs> Ati Sundar. So she says, Me? Ya meri kala. 
<laughs> so he says kala of course and you know, then she says okay but you know give me your kingdom then so the next morning the uh, the all the his courtiers he says i'm giving her the kingdom so the the courtiers say but uh, that was a dream so he says yes but isn't life maya how do we tell maya from a dream so at that moment suddenly you see a, such a depth of scholarship in homi vadia <laughs> or whoever wrote that film it's actually like such a question amazing and then she dances with raj kapoor first raj she's done prithviraj now she dances with raj kapoor in annadi and she comes near him at one point and he says we know and he runs <laughs> Raj Kapoor was like that, slightly Adi Chaddi. <laughs> and then she dances with Rishi Kapoor. Three generations. That was something. So I thought, you know, and this is the other question that I got: Why a book about Helen? And I always felt it was because one, she was a woman; two, she was an achaniya; and three, she was obviously not upper caste Hindu. and she's franco burmese i mean her name is helen she's obviously a christian and so that was the reason why are you asking these questions and the reason why i think she could be helen was because she was all these she wasn't us she was a different person so she could be anything she could be mera naam chin chin chu she could be anything she wanted she was polysemic and she could fit into whatever whatever the narrative discourse was that's why i wrote about her because i thought it was fascinating hey bas now how are you ha huh. Okay, one. Let's let's get this responsibility thing out of the room. And it is an irresponsibility. I totally get it. I'm not a transcreationist. I don't believe that it's a transcreation. And like, if if it wasn't in the original, I wasn't doing it in my translation. And what was in the original will be in the translation because this is a part of literary history. And I'm not. I wasn't going to. to put jerry pinto in where baluta was required right this was fundamental belief but second thing it is only in india where we see a translation as one the first translation as the last translation i hope there will be other translations if my translation stands the test of time i'll be delighted really delighted but if it is not a good translation and someone thinks they can do better some young mahar scholar who right now is working on his phd program who thinks who the fuck was this boy to come and translate why should we have a roman catholic who didn't know anything about mahar about mahar's doing this work yeah and he wants to do a better translation i'd say he should he definitely should right she should it should <laughs> yeah you have absolutely no idea who it is going to be yeah she should it should whoever it is should but the point is now having done it okay the first the most difficult thing about it is not a with cobalt blue it was a walk in the park because there were people like us middle class people with middle class preoccupations about about you know how it will look and what people will think and you know that kind of thing and it was very clearly a land a, a turf which which i was familiar here it wasn't a familiar turf at all then the second problem was that it was i hadn't signed on to do poetry Poetry, like really, really, is different. Translating poetry is like just madness. It's horrid. You shouldn't do it unless you're like really a masochist. So I'm doing it now. <laughs> I have a hair shirt underneath, and I have a cicatrice on my thigh. Only because of Dan Brown, we know cicatrice. No one knew the word before that. Yeah. Anyway, so there was poetry in the middle, right? And finally, there was. a narrative of uh, there were two kinds of marathi one marathi is the marathi of the mahar and the other marathi was pune kari marathi if you ever read a book called uh, maida aidan by urmila pawar if you read it in the original marathi you will see that the first sections of it are almost incomprehensible to the marathi reader 
They are written in such a rustic dialect. But as she grows older, and as she is slowly Sanskritized, her formal education starts taking place. She begins to be told, you can't talk like that, you have to talk like this. Her Marathi becomes a more Punekari Marathi. So, many of the reviews said I use a, a racy colloquial style. Sorry boss. How do I get English? Which in this, okay, there are two, there's one way of doing it. Have you, um, if you should ever look at this lovely poem by Arun Kolatkar, uh, which is called Song of a Hired Man, no, uh, it's, it's fundamentally this story of a young man who wants his money, okay? He writes it in Marathi and he writes it in English. Two versions, same poet. In the, in the English version he uses black slang. Where in Marathi he is used colloquial Marathi. I, this is his poem. He is welcome to do what he wants. I thought it would muddy the waters for me to suddenly break into rap. <laughs> because what do you know about, what do we know about how black people talk except rap? And I'm sure black people don't go about <laughs> all the time. I mean, yeah. So fundamentally, how do I get two different sophistication registers into a language here which is fundamentally the language of sophistication.